I just wanted to welcome you to Bridge Church this morning, especially if you're new here. We're so glad that everybody is here, elves included. Very excited about the elves being here today. So we are going to get things started. We've got an Elf on the Shelf contest today, and immediately following that, we've got our beautiful children to come up and sing a couple songs, and then service as normal after that. So we've got a lot of exciting stuff happening today, and we are so, so glad that you guys are here. So we are going to go ahead and possibly, maybe, get started <laughs> on our Elf on the Shelf contest. Um, we are going to watch each elf come across the stage and be presented to our judges on the front row, and then we'll have one winner to be announced of the most creative, original, fun idea, or however the judges want to judge it. We'll see. And um, we're really excited. So thank you guys so much for being here. We are, I think, ready to go. So here we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I will be your MC for this morning's Elf on the Shelf contest. My name is Brandon. How are you guys feeling this morning? Pretty good? Very nice, very nice. Let me introduce a few people that is going to play an important role in this morning's event. First and foremost, you may be thinking to yourself, when do I, as a crowd member, make some noise, clap, give it up for our wonderful contestants. Well, we took the extra mile, invited some of our people from Bridge Students up to guide you on exactly when you need to make some noise to cheer on our kids. So go ahead and show them your signs. So when you see the following, let's practice. You'll know what to do. Very nice. And then last but certainly not least, we have our wonderful judges. So let's give it up for Mr. and Mrs. Ingram, judges number one. And judge couple number two is Mr. and Mrs. McDowell. Give it up. All right, they have been instructed to be fair, but honest. So there will be winners and there will be losers, but you're loved either way, okay? Fair enough, that's the best I can do, okay? All right, so without further ado, let's get into it. First and foremost, we have Sophia, Ava, Marley, and Everly Young. Come on up front and center. We've got, uh, looks like Mr. Potato Head with some wonderful french fries. I'm not trying to say anything, but if you offer some french fries to our judges, it might help you, I'm just saying. Give it up for them one more time. Next we have Miss Grayson White. Give it up for Miss Grayson. Come on out, Grayson. Oh, wow. Bridge Church, is that Barbie? Barbie bus? Show the, show the crowd what you got there. It's heavy? Okay, fair enough. Give it up for Miss Grayson one more time. Next we have Emerson, Blakely, and Ella Brown. Come on out, guys. Give, give it up. Matching outfits. Show, show the people your wonderful elf on the shelf. Make sure you show these four right here. These are your judges. So very, very nice. Good job. You guys can go ahead over. Next, we have Kendall and Harrison Lawrence. Give it up for them. Oh, Barbie sports car. Hello. Very nice. Very nice. All right. You guys are good. Good job. Next, we have Ruby Brockman. Give it up for Ruby. She is in her Elf on the Shelf era, if you will. Don't got, if you guys know who this is, Taylor Swift. She's kind of a big deal these days. Very nicely done. All right, you can go ahead. That's, that's good. Next, we have Miss Sydney Davis. Give it up for Sydney. Oh, and little sister, I believe, has joined. Very nice. Come on out, guys. We've got, is that Barbie suitcase? I think, I don't know. Okay, very good, very good, very good. Who we got next here? 
Tori and Jack, come on out, guys. Tori and Jack Sigley got their Elf on the Shelf wagon going. I like it. Ooh, look at the snowman. Very nice, very nice. You guys can head on over. Next, we have Miss Lyric Schaefer. She has all of the four food groups, according to Buddy the Elf there. Candy, candy canes, syrup, and candy corn. Very good. Next, we have Asher and Ainsley Hale. Give it up for Asher and Ainsley. Look at this. Buzz, Woody, Barbie. I mean, you got everything you could pop. Roblox? Like, come on. That's all you could ever need. Good job. Good job, guys. Very nice. Next, we have Josie Leg, bringing the one and only most beautiful elf of the day. Look at that. <laughs> no explanation needed. No explanation needed. Next, we have Elena Williamson. Come on up. Oh, very nice. We've got hashtag elf vibes. Very nice. Sports car. Gotta love it. Next, we have Jace Hallett. Come on out, Jace. Oh, oh. Is this the Megalodon? Uh-oh. Jace sporting the Megalodon elf on the shelf. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice, man. Looks cool. Give it up for Jace. <laughs> Next, we have Lydia and Livia Jones. Give it up for the Jones Squad. We've got all kinds. Oh, okay. That is, I don't need, oh. Very nicely done. Next, we have Miss Kennedy Lake. Give it up for Miss Kennedy. With the Lego dump truck. I'm pretty sure that has to be assembled before you can use it, right? The Lego set? Yeah, so that didn't come out of the box like that. She had to build it. Very nice. Very nicely done. Next, we have Miss Aviana Kessler. Give it up for Aviana with the, what is that, Barbie sports car? What is it? Oh, okay, I'm not, I, it's a pink car, give it up. I don't know, I'm sorry. And then last but certainly not least, we have Meadow Gray, give it up. Oh, very nice, hot air balloon vibe, okay, I like that. It's from the movie Up, you know, with the balloons, and very nice, I like it, very good. I believe that is it, right? All right, give it up one more time for all of our contestants. All right, judges, without further ado, it is your time to shine. You can consult amongst yourselves for a couple of minutes, and while you guys do that, I will be telling the rest of the crowd what is up for grabs this morning, because the winner that is crowned, <laughs> did everybody get a french fry? Yeah. We, um, while they consult, let me explain what the winner is going home with. Winner of today's contest is going home with a free putt-putt session from Reed's Entertainment across the uh, Liberty Square. They hooked us up with some free mini golf sessions for not only the winner, but the whole family. So they will be able to get their mini golf on. Our judges are consulting. We will give them just a few more moments here, and then we will crown our winner.
So too, while they finish up, we're gonna go ahead and invite all the kids to come over to the stage here with Miss Heather. Elementary as well. They're gonna be uh, getting ready for a choir this morning. So if we could have all the kids in elementary over there to my stage, this side of the stage. All right, guys, the verdict, verdict is in. We have a winner. So after the judges consulted and after much debate and back and forth, it was very close between two. So we'll bring up, well, we won't bring up, but we will announce the two that it was close, the two finalists, and then we'll announce the winners, okay? The two finalists that were very, very, very close was contestant number 16, Kennedy Lake. Where's she at? And the other one was contestant number 12, Josie Legg. Those were the two very, very close 
So, there can only be one winner. And after much debate, the winner of the 2023 Elf on the Shelf contest is contestant number, drum roll please, Kennedy Lake. <laughs> Congratulations to all of our wonderful elves. Very, very close second. Uh, Neil, shout out to you, man. Dad of the year. And uh, we'll get Kids Choir going in just a second.
shall have eternal life. And I shall hold to the cross. And I shall hold to God alone for his love. time for God so love. time today just the voices say this together and for God so
eternal life. They shall have eternal life. That was good to say that together today, wasn't it? Can you just bow your heads for a second? God, thank you so much that beneath the current of the busyness of Christmas and the holidays, that the one thing that tethers us to who we are is that you sent your son because you loved us so much that he gave everything he had to connect us back to you. God, we're forever grateful and thankful for that today. And I pray that every person in this room gets a moment today to feel that love, to feel that acceptance. God, be with us in church today. And everyone say together, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning again. Well, that was a lot of fun. There's a lot, a lot that's happened since I've been up here. So we're, again, we're so glad that you guys are here with us today. Um, I have a few things to announce to you, and we are um, excited for all of the things going on at Bridge Church in the next couple weeks. Uh, next week, we have our Christmas cookie contest, and we've asked a few um, people in the church to bake their best Christmas cookie, and we're going to have some really special judges, so you do not want to miss it. Um, we're really excited about this event because we get... The this is a way for us to practice community and to celebrate different people that make Bridge Church who it is. And we um, all love to have a good Christmas cookie recipe, and we will have those recipes for you to hand out at the end of service next week. So all the people that enter their um, cookies will also provide their recipes, unless it's like a super big family secret, and then we will not be given those recipes, maybe. <laughs> but hopefully, everyone will be able to provide those. And then the next exciting thing is Christmas Eve service. And so we will not be having service that morning on Sunday the 24th. We will just be having our 5 p.m. service, and all of the festivities kick off at 4.30. And um, we're very excited to open the doors to our, uh, of our church to invite the community in for our Christmas Eve service. It's a way that we can be hospitable to the world around us by inviting them to come and be with us in the celebration of Jesus coming to our world and having a big party um, with lots of fun and meaning for the Christmas season. And so we invite all of you all to come and be a part of that in two weeks. Can't believe it's two weeks. Um, and we are really excited about that. We're so excited that you guys are here, and we're going to kick it off to Mr. Matt now. I want to invite you to know this. Christmas Eve is a big deal around us for a lot of reasons. And one of those reasons is we believe that there is this ultimate reality in which you and I are constantly being changed. And sometimes it happens in a moment, and sometimes it happens over the lifetime. God gets to do what he wants. But we believe Christmas Eve is an opportunity. It is a, it is a space, it is an opportunity for people who are considering who Jesus is to give him a shot. And so I want to ask for your help in inviting people to fill up our Christmas Eve service. Why? Because real people need real hope that's only available through the real Jesus this season. And so we're going to give you a way to do that. There are going to be cards at the end of service today and next week. There will be beautiful people all around speak, sprinkled by these doors to hand you a card that you can use as a simple invite. So I would invite you, even if you don't feel the gumption to do it yet, take it in faith, consider it and pray. Who is someone in my circle, family, work, friends, neighbors, that I can hand a invite card to come back for Christmas Eve this season. Would you be an inviter this Christmas season? Would you be an inviter? Yeah, let's do it together, guys. So with that said, now begins our hour-long message at 1120. <laughs> Just kidding. Everybody, take a big breath. All right. And we'll put a picture of two doors behind me. Here are two doors that are in front of you right now. And today, whether you know it or not, you are stepping towards and possibly through one of these doors. And go on this imaginative exercise with me. It's actually no mystery what's behind each door. Two doors leading to two very different futures. 
Behind the first door is a future full of anger, future full of hostility, of bitterness, of up and down relationships, of resentment and vengeance and compounding hurt and frustration and rumination. And over the course of time, to step through this door over and over again feels like being stuck and all twisted and knotted up on the inside. But there's another door. Behind the second door is a different kind of future. It's one of freedom. It's one of peace. It's full of relational up and downs, but it has some hope in there. It's full of honesty and humility, of healing all at once and over the course of the lifetime, your lifetime. It's full of some relational repairs. And over the course of time, there's more wholeness, not less. And there's internal freedom with space to exist and be present. The second door stands in stark contrast to the first door. And imagine with me in your mind's eye that above that first door, a sign appears. And above that first door, with a future full of, of bitterness and resentment and rumination and vengeance and all those negative things we named, is a simple title, simple word called unforgiveness. And above the second door is a word called forgiveness. Keep that in your mind's eye for a moment and catch this about myself. I've never really thought of myself as an angry person. I always thought of myself as very easygoing, and for most of my life, if you were to ask me who were my enemies, I would have had a hard time naming any names. But as I've gotten older and life and its relationships get more complicated and new kinds of pressure and stress come with this thing called life and apprenticeship with Jesus, I felt myself walking through door number one more often than I'd prefer. Like you, like our community together, we are on a journey, a journey of forgiveness. And here's what I know, that you and I, we live in a hurting world, and we are hurting people. To hurt or to hurt one another, that is natural and it is all too normal. But to forgive, that's supernatural. Really, it's miraculous. It's a taste of heaven on earth, and it's a taste of the coming future reality of God's new creation washing into this one. Forgiveness, it is messy. It is mysterious, and it is very, very confusing. And it's a journey that doesn't have to be traveled alone. God is your companion. In fact, the basis of forgiveness is God himself. God invented forgiveness. The prophet Micah spoke of God this way when he uttered these profound words very poetically. He said, who is a God like you? who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us, and you will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Can you picture that imagery? How beautiful. The basis of forgiveness is God himself. But God not only invented forgiveness, you know, he is forgiveness. Jesus is our forgiveness. He gave his very life, we sang about it this morning, as a sacrifice for our ultimate forgiveness. And he lived his life in a way that can serve as a model for us to follow when it comes to this area of door number one, a future full of resentment, bitterness, anger, and internal toxins that have no way of escaping but to pollute you, or forgiveness wholeness, peace, maybe reconciliation where appropriate. Jesus taught us to pray something pretty specific. Of all the things he could have told us to pray, he made sure to mention, when you pray, ask God this phrase, forgive us our debts. Us, us, it's a communal act. Forgive us our debts as we forgive the debts of others. Dallas Willard, one of my heroes, it's been a few weeks, so I throw in a little Willard this morning. He said that the most important thing that God gets out of your life is not what you do, but it is who you are becoming. Door number one, is that shaping who you are becoming, or is it door number two? Or 
let's not set it up as if we don't step through both over the course of our lifetimes. That is the question that shapes everything. Who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? When it comes to these doors, which do you find yourself stepping through? So here's the basis of where we're going for a few minutes today and then next Sunday. I want to talk about the two doors. These two doors with two very different futures called unforgiveness and forgiveness. And again, remember, to hurt, that's normal. To be hurt and to hurt others, that is normal. But to forgive, it's miraculous. It's heaven on earth stuff. And listen, let's be honest for a second. You may have walked in here today under the surface or maybe on the surface and you think it's beneath the surface, whatever's going on. You may be an unforgiving mess today. But can I tell you, this is not a message of condemnation. This is a message that says this. God's not after your perfection in this journey. He's just after your heart. He's not after get it right every time. He's after you. And let him mold you and shape you and change you into a becoming a forgiving person over the course of your lifetime. Because you know in your head that's what he offered you. But is it shaping who you're becoming from the inside out? He loves you exactly as you are right now. But he also loves you enough to invite you into more, to better, to different. And with God's help this morning, however you came in, you can change. You can heal, you can be set free, you can stop patterns and generations and cycles and ups and downs. You can stop those things and you are valuable enough to walk that journey. You can be more whole. And yes, there are real steps you can take, but sometimes it starts not with putting steps of forgiveness into practice. It starts with a whole other journey and type of miracle. And it's this, that oftentimes forgiveness is actually a journey of the healing of your unforgiveness rather than it is doing forgiveness. That's a profound statement. Oftentimes your journey of forgiveness is more about the undoing and the healing of your unforgiveness rather than it is, here's three steps to put forgiveness into your life. My favorite poems ever, I've brought this to you before, it fits here today so well. The African-American poet Langston Hughes once wrote, I am so tired of waiting, aren't you, for the world to become good and beautiful and kind. Let us take a knife and cut the world in two and see what worms are eating at the rind. And this poem is not advocating for more division. We have enough of that. Instead, it's advocating for something very different, for a look inward. For looking inward, there is an invitation to you today and every day, particularly as we are naming it this Christmas season, to name some things in us and in the world that are destroying us from the inside. And can I say, unforgiveness, the healing of our unforgiveness is one of those worms eating at the rind of our existence and at the rind of our world. Unforgiveness is like a disease that slowly slowly destroys us. Understandably, many of us get stuck in these patterns of unforgiveness. Why? Because we're hurt, and you were wounded, and there's no excuse for it. And we're talking about some boundaries next week in that journey, but let's level. The question in your life is not if you'll be hurt, it's when, and by who, and to what degree. That's a good recipe for some unforgiveness to set in, isn't it? Hurt doesn't have to be your future, though. Why? Because healing is on offer. Healing is on offer. Forgiveness is on offer. And sometimes, again, it's about the healing of our unforgiveness. Next week, we're going to look at a research-based, theologically sound kind of steps called the REACH method by a guy named Everett Worthington, fantastic thinker, writer, author, psychologist, Christian thinker on this subject of how to put together forgive, how to walk the journey of forgiveness. But this week, I want to name a different counter cycle. There's actually a journey that leads to unforgiveness in the same way there's a journey that leads to forgiveness. And try this on with your life. You can think of the person that maybe is the aggressor. If they're sitting next to you, be very, very careful, okay? Um, here's the journey. Number one, phase one, it's transgression. Somebody does something to you. 
Somebody criticizes you, somebody rejects you, something posts, something, something passive aggressive, something on the face, whatever it is, there's a transgression at you directed towards you. So there's the offense, right? And then phase two, there's your perception. Everybody say perception. Perception of the offense. And this, my friends, is where it gets very, very tricky. Very tricky. Have you ever had one of those situations where you were deeply, like deeply, passionately, righteously offended by someone only to find out it is not at all what they meant? Like, have you ever held on to something against someone for like maybe days, sometimes for years, and you finally go to talk to that person and like, dog, that is not at all what was in my heart. I'm sorry you came away. So perception is tricky. Can I just say this right off the top? And this isn't to minimize or victim shame or do any of those sort of things, but let's live at a different conversation today. Can we say that sometimes our perception of offenses may not be accurate to the actual offense coming against us? For example, later today, if you're in traffic and someone cuts you off and the three-finger trumpet begins to play and you're trying to decide whether or not to give that particular fingering to the sound that's coming out of your heart through anger and transgression and offense very righteously and dangerously as you're driving your children just home from a good day of being Jesus people at church. What if, not speaking from any personal experience, um, what if, what if what you thought was a personal attack on your safety was just a literal mistake in a blind spot? And... Yeah, I'm going to throw this in there. What if they were to pass you and then you just realized their license plate said Ohio on it and then it all made sense? (laughs) So like... (laughs) (laughs) So nothing more needs said about that. There is a gap. There is a gap. There is a gap between the offense and our perception of it. There is an action and a reaction. We actually have some control of our reaction that exists in the the space, the gap between action and reaction. Here's something else we're prone to do. If I do a mess up to someone else, I'm prone to say, oh, that's my bad. It's just a mistake. If someone does it to me, it's an attack. It's, It's their character. It's who they are. What I did is just a little circumstantial problem. What they did... It's a character flaw. So so perception is really tricky. We are horrible, we are horrible, horrible perceivers. That's an area to work in. So, but here's the third. Transgression, perception, may or may not match the intent. And the third is emotion. This is the journey towards unforgiveness. Anger, hurt, fear. These are all negative emotions, right? Right? They're negative emotions. But is anger unforgiveness? Not necessarily. Is fear unforgiveness? No, not not at all. Is is hurt unforgiveness? No, those are natural. God wired you with those things, right? They're they're like a warning light on the dashboard of your nervous system and your, your soul to say, hey, something's up here, pay attention to it, and you have an opportunity. How will you host this towards forgiveness or towards unforgiveness over the course of your life? So I want you to see that transgression, perception, emotion, not unforgiveness. But here's where it gets tricky. He, Everett Worthington, names the fourth stage, and it's called rumination. I love that word. Can you say rumination? Rumination. Rumination is a way of reinforcing our bad perceptions. This is coming to me off the top of my brain. It's probably not appropriate, I'm going to say it, and you can offer forgiveness later. You know that scene in Austin Powers (laughs) where there's the bigger guy, and he says, I'm unhappy because I eat, and I eat because I'm unhappy. That is rumination. It's this self, yes, Austin Powers just got brought into the church today. All right, um, elves were here. He's still sitting there, and it is blowing my mind. And um, rumination, rumination. It's this self-perpetuating cycle. When I mess up towards a person, I don't tend to rehearse 
the story that made me bad towards them. When someone else mess messes up towards me, we are prone to retelling, rehashing, distorting, dislodging, disintegrating ourselves by constantly telling that story. And how many of you know what started at a level one when you first started telling that story started, gets to eventually over the course of lifetime a compounding effect of worse. It's like when a Ohio teenager takes that first test and we're giving them freedom to drive on the roads. And then 10 years later, they're going 40 miles per hour in a 60 mile per hour speed zone on the left-hand lane. Rumination, I'm rehearsing these hatred of Ohio drivers. Rumination, it is not helpful. It's when we get stuck in retelling the story. And who often becomes the victim and who often becomes the villain in our ruminating of people? We lose the nuance of someone's just complexity and their humanity. And we become more and more self-righteously elevated and they become more and more dig undignified. And over time, rumination usually and can often lead towards unforgiveness. So what is unforgiveness? It's a blend of all of that. You have your own internal recipe of unforgiveness based on who you are, based on your story, based on your chemical makeup, based on the, the health of your soul, your feeling of belonging to God and experiencing his forgiveness and his acceptance or not, the feeling of feeling safe among other people. There's a lot of things that go into that concoction that eventually leads towards unforgiveness. And let me tell you, unforgiveness isn't just a spiritual abstract thing. It is something that lodges itself in your body at a neurochemical muscular level. For example, if there's a person that you are ruminating about right now, don't look at them if they're in the room. Or if this has been in your past before Jesus healed you, we can give that church out as well. If you've experienced that and then all of a sudden their name comes to mind or you hear their voice at work or they make a post online and your body physically, neurologically goes, mm, it means unforgiveness is in your body. There's a lot of research on that, and here's my point. Your journey towards forgiveness will almost always start or contain or include the undoing of the cycle that we just named and the healing of the unforgiveness that's in your heart. And that sounds really obvious. Like, well, of course, the anti of forgiveness is unforgiveness. That's all you got today? Like, nicely done, Matt. Ohio, that was funny, I get it. Austin Powers, really, really smart to throw in there, whatever. But here's my question, y'all, guys. How often are you ruminating? What stories are filling your mind when it comes to people? And I don't mean those people. That's the easy one. I mean, like, the people you share life with. Is there honesty there? Is there unforgiveness towards the people God has put in your life to be the prime example and container refinement of your own experience of and practice of forgiveness? How are you ruminating? What stories are you rehearsing over and over again? And at its worst, you can truly be a victim, so I am not dismissing that. I just don't have time to nuance everything in that lane today. There are real victims in the room today. And there are not real victims in the room today. There are self-created victims through rumination, where we perpetuate our own self-righteousness, our own story, our own, we project our own hurts and our own needs onto other people, and there is something on offer to us, you and I. And it is, sits at the intersection of the forgiveness of God being offered to us and living in that over and over and over again and rehearsing who Jesus, what Jesus has done for you, rehearsing the fact that he forgives us, the, rehearsing the fact that he gets to close these gaps of our identity and our wholeness and our integration, rehearsing that and then saying, you know what? 
I'm no better than this person who has done something to me. And I'm going to try to get down into the core of who I am. Mind, body, soul, my thought patterns, my relationships, my emotions. To see them in the way that God sees me. And if I'm going to ruminate, I'm going to flip it on its head. And I'm going to tell stories of who God says that person is. I'm going to think about a future that sees them in a positive light. How are you telling those stories? Oftentimes, God tells us to forgive, not to heal or fix the other person, but to heal ourselves. God is asking you, he asks you to forgive, to heal you. I just want to tell you today, like, unforgiveness wants to have you. It wants to control you. It wants to take host to your life and destroy you slowly and destroy your relationships over time. But it doesn't have to. You can change. You can choose a different door. And yes, there are real steps that you can take. But one of the steps I just want to name today in closing is, through a question, what are you ruminating on? What story is the most powerful story that is shaping who you're becoming and the relationships you have with other people? Not to be dismissive of your hurt or your story, but underneath that, the more powerful story that we have because of Jesus, who changes the world by changing us and turns us from unforgivers to forgivers because he takes our unforgiveness and forgives us, is that Jesus' story is more powerful than the story, however real and damaging and distant it has made you from yourself and from God. Hear me this morning. Unforgiveness doesn't have to rule your life. It doesn't have to rule your life with God, with yourself, and with other people. There is a gift being offered through the death, the burial, the resurrection, the life, the teaching, and the power of Jesus Christ today. And his spirit is here with us. It's not off in the distance. It's right here. And it's actually in some of the, it's in those of you who are a follower of Jesus this morning, where eventually there is this beauty to following Jesus, where we do it honestly and humbly, looking for Jesus to slowly change us, where the doors become less of a battle. And it just becomes who you are. It becomes who you are. If you are forgiven by Jesus, we have no other option but over the course of our lifetime to become forgiving people. Far be it from us and the future of our church and the way we love one another and reach our community to ever think it will be through our self-righteousness, through our goodness, through our perfection, and through our unforgiveness that will set us apart like a light on a hill that can't be hidden. Light heals, and it exposes darkness. It doesn't just expose it. It instantly has power over it. Jesus came as the light of the world to heal you from your state of unforgiveness and to give you the power and the model to become a forgiver of people. What are you ruminating on? What are you ruminating on? What story has the last word in your life? So would you go ahead and stand? I want to end slightly differently this morning on a day that's been full of fun. And I want to read to you a prayer. It's written by someone else. It's from a book that I hold really sacred in my life. It's called Liturgies for Hope. And there's a liturgy, just a written prayer. I know that sounds fancy. It's just a written prayer. It's called a a prayer for those struggling to forgive. And so I want to invite you today to take our posture of humility, where we just ground ourselves, our feet firmly planted on the ground, our, our arms out. If you're new to us today, it's just a way of connecting our body to the moment, because we are all one thing. 
And in your own way, if you would just kind of take a moment and try to let the distractions and the worries and the thoughts of what's next fall to the side and focus your mind's eye on Jesus, focus your mind's eye on who you are, and just invite the Holy Spirit into this moment. Say, come Holy Spirit. Not because he wasn't here already, but when we utter those words, sometimes it helps us to become more aware of him. And so I just want to read this prayer over us, for us, on your behalf. And as we sing, it's just space for us to reflect and look inward at what rinds may, what worms may be eating us at the rind. And so here's the prayer. O oh God of justice, forgiveness feels like a journey in an unfair direction. Blinded by fury and crippled with hurt, I feel as though you have assigned me an impossible task. How does one forgive when the debt is so great? How does one pardon when the offense has cost life, health, or happiness? When I look within myself, I find that I lack the strength to extend the arm of mercy that's been extended to me. When I look within myself, I find I lack the compassion that was softened my heart to another. When I look within myself, I find that though I have been forgiven much, I am unable to forgive a little. O oh, kind and benevolent King, you have set the example of pardon, illuminating how it frees even the most hopeless of captives free. Would you hold space with me now as I mourn the wrong done and the pain inflicted? For you don't ask us to overlook the severity of wrongdoing, but desire us to release the perpetrator from their deserved consequences, to cancel the debt that they cannot pay. No one has forgiven a greater debt than you, Lord, and you are well acquainted with its price. Help me cease the meticulous weighing of scales and trust you with life's inevitable imbalances. Help me remove the penalties that I have assigned to my enemy and place them in your hand instead. When everything in me rises up to seek revenge, help me to fall back on your strength. And when I can't pacify my anger and my resentment, teach me, O King, the mystery of enemy love. Give me compassion for the wounds that have driven my adversary to wound. And may forgiveness lay a foundation for both of our healing. Let me learn from you, humble teacher, and grant me your tender heart of kindness, your sharp eye for integrity. Justice and mercy are twin rivers that run straight from your heart, and forgiveness will flow from a soul that trusts in your sufficiency. Where I judge, let me judge not. Where I condemn, let me condemn not. For I have received immeasurably more forgiveness than I will ever have to dispense. My whole life flourishes out of the grace that you have given me, Lord. And may I dance in the delight of my own forgiveness, seeking you for the grace to forgive others. May I walk closely with you, Lord, journeying down the path of forgiveness and mercy as you show me the way. Amen. Jesus, would you seal this word in the hearts of your people? And may their mind's eye be taken to you this morning, you on the cross, you the forgiver, you the one with power over every ounce of sin and shame and relational struggle we wrestle with. May their mind's eye may even, maybe even be cast to the one who is right now their enemy. May we take your word seriously to forgive as we have been forgiven. Hurt, that's normal. But forgiveness, that's the miraculous. Jesus, do the miraculous as we sing.
here with us. We have a special gift outside in the lobby for you at the new here table on the left. And we'd love for you to fill out a connect card so we, so we can stay connected with you. And um, other ways to connect with us, make sure you're following us on social media, YouTube, and uh, download our app. And we're just so excited that you're here with us today. And don't forget to uh, grab your Christmas Eve cards, invitations to hand out to loved ones and friends. And so make sure to see, we have ushers at the door. And yeah, so again, we're so excited that you guys are here with us today. We hope you have a great week. Thank you.